Welcome to the Asbestos Knowledge Empire. What does asbestos management mean to you? I used to really struggle with the asbestos management at my site, but now it's a breeze. It used to be really expensive. I was paying loads, but now I've got my asbestos power team in place. It's so much easier. Asbestos can be a pain in the ass if not handled right. We had to stop the job because asbestos was discovered. Now we don't have that problem. Asbestos management is easier than you think. Asbestos management, be proactive, not reactive. Think about asbestos first, not last. And now your hosts, best-selling authors and asbestos experts, Ian Stone and Neil Munro. Welcome to the Asbestos Knowledge Empire. I'm Ian Stone. I'm Neil Munro. So today we're coming to you live from a farmer's field in the middle of Northamptonshire. <laughs> it's rather a nice day, so we thought we'll, uh, we'll record this one outside. Yes. Yeah. So. T- today we're talking about how do you plan an asbestos refurbishment survey? Now, the obvious answer is, well, think about it before you start. But what are the things that you actually need to think about? And we were just chatting about it before we hit the record button. And there's a lot of things that people have to kind of take into consideration, don't they? Yeah, I think we have kind of touched on elements of this on previous podcasts. But it's surprisingly how this is... Um, a constant, not issue with clients, but educating clients about... Um, it is a little bit of a battle. Yes, yeah, exactly that. It's a common sort of issue we have to face on a regular basis on, you know, get, getting the right information, educating the client on what's exactly involved with an asbestos refurbishment survey, what what the site's going to look like afterwards and what they need to prepare and 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 kind of think about the future... Um, management, which is is never thought about. It's the future management of asbestos, which impacts the survey as well. Definitely. So we kind of wanted to cover the basis from the beginning, really. Yeah, and when you say client, I mean, clients for us can be end user, client, duty holder, yeah. the actual person who's in charge of the building, who's planned the works themselves. But a lot of the time we work on behalf of contractors, yes. where the client perhaps hasn't got that level of education needed to manage a project or even doesn't want to. Or uh, even though there's a requirement to yeah, have a refurbishment survey. Exactly. So they'll, they'll package off the whole parcel of works that basically cover the rip-out works, the reinstatement works, but also under that is the asbestos works. So sometimes we, we work directly for, for the contractors. Now, it always makes me quite surprised, although I shouldn't be surprised anymore, but the amount of times what we get called in at the last minute of... Oh, yeah, we've started a project this week and yeah. we need a health and safety have identified we need a survey. Which um, is insane. It is insane. <laughs> and like on, on the projects that it happens, it's like, I don't know, ridiculous. Some of them are like multi million pound projects. Yeah. And just it blows my mind still that we kind of get called in at last knock ins. But even worse than that, oh, we've finished this project. Yeah. But we need to have an asbestos survey for the file. Yeah, for the CDM file. <laughs> and you just think, you what? Yeah. How is that even possible in this day and age? It is. It's crazy. But that has actually happened very recently. Yeah, no, it has. It has. It's madness. But yeah, so how do we plan it? Well, like I said right at the beginning, I mean, the obvious thing is to think about it first. It sounds obvious, doesn't it? It does. But it's a little bit less obvious in what you've got to think about. Yeah. Because a lot of the time, I mean, again, we get asked for to do surveys for schemes sometimes where there's like a basic concept of, right, we know we're going to rip all the walls out of this room, we're going to rip the ceiling down and we're going to replace everything, but we're not quite sure exactly what's what and where's going where. And that presents its own problems for things such as electrics, doesn't it? Yeah, all services really, yeah, Mm. Um, depending on what's going to go back. Yeah, like you said, you may be planning a, a basic refurb which then turns into you know a more complex refurb I and mean, it's having that information so it's a good idea to get all the, the kind of relevant trades involved at the beginning to get a kind of defined scope from them yeah you know you may have your plans in your head of yeah we just want to reconfigure a few rooms but if you don't know exactly what's involved with regards to other trades then you don't know what you know the extent of that Upgrade. So, for instance, if, if electrics need replacing, you may be talking re, you know, re-armored cabling to upgrade, you know, the electrical supply to the individual units or buildings yeah. or even the rooms. Exactly, because I mean, 
sometimes <clears throat> in your own mind you might think, right, well, yeah, they can just lop the electrics out of here, put dead them off, yeah. and then they put the new stuff on that, and then we're all good. But that doesn't always work, does it? No, it doesn't. And it depends on the age of the building, depends how old the electrics are, depends on what is going new in, because if you're changing the use of a room and it's turning from, I don't know, an office into a workshop, well, if you've got big, um, powerful machines in there, they're going to be drawing down a lot more electricity. And like you say, they might need new armoured cabling to go in. And again, where's that going to be rooted? And it always like surprises me when I've been on projects when I think, well, surely you could just go through there, through there, through there, yeah. and you're back to the mains and that's it. But then there's rules, there's regulations, there's reasons that they have to perhaps take a longer route um, and things like that, which has kind of would have caught me by surprise Yeah, if I was kind of doing the electrics on that project. Yeah, definitely. So it's getting the right professionals in at yeah. the right time to take that advice on and uh, to determine the, the full scope of what's required, really. And, and kind of the, the next sort of thing to think about is how is this going to take place? So how is the refurb going to take place? How are you actually going to manage that? Is it an empty site or have you still got occupants in the site? And it's kind of building that round and that, that plan of how are these works actually going to happen and thinking about, well, how's the asbestos survey going to happen as well? Because if you've still got a trading operational office location building, then, you know, an asbestos refurbishment survey, just to, due to the intrusive and destructive nature of those surveys, you need to think, how's that going to happen? And um, when's that going to be undertaken? And can you do that? physically without sort of decamping the actual whole building. Yeah, and I'm thinking about the project that we did recently in a pharmacy and that was kind of very piecemeal, wasn't yes. it? Because it was in a large hospital, the main pharmacy in the hospital, so they were struggling for space already. They couldn't decamp that entire pharmacy. Can't so shut pharmacy down. No, there. exactly. Yeah, no one would get anything. No, so we really had to do it piecemeal, bit by bit by bit. And then that was the same with the refurbishment contractors following along yeah. it was kind of sectioned off an area at a time so it was a very long laborious process something that would have taken i don't know a couple of surveyors a couple of days to do that full refurbishment survey in one hit ended up t taking several several visits yeah because there was no other option and we just had to work around the, the pharmacy's requirements the needs of the hospital and then also around that of the refurbishment contracts of going in there and carrying out the works. Yeah, which again, that's um, probably the most expensive way of doing things, really. Yeah. So you kind of have to weigh up the difference between shutting down, getting the job done, the refurb, you know, the survey, everything in one clear project versus, you know, splitting it down into kind of manageable um, sections. Yeah, and that's the same for the whole project it's like as an entirety, yeah. isn't it? Of, okay, yeah, you might get the works done cheaper, but then you have to consider the whole like decamping, yep, the setting up elsewhere. isn't it? Exactly that. Yeah, so to undertake a, a special refurbishment survey, you know, really the areas where you plan to do works should be unoccupied. Yeah, they've got to be. I mean, we can sometimes do stuff out of hours if it's small projects and we can go in overnight and kind of make the disruption and the damage that we need to, but then clean up after ourselves, patch over the holes, things like that. So the next morning when the workers come back in to use that area, it's still usable and it's safe to do so. And there's just kind of patches over the wall where we've made inspection holes and things like that. Yeah. But that really depends on the scope, doesn't it? It does. You know, if you're talking about a full refurb, so, you know, you're literally clearing everything out back to shell, you know, so it's literally just the structural element of the location. Yeah, that's impossible to do. Then you can't really do that fully with those kind of operational restrictions on the surveyors because they really do need to open up elements of the building, which sometimes they don't go back properly, do they? No. Um, you know, to give you an example, you know, like if you're taking a window out, you know, we need to check within the, the cavity surrounding the windows, even popping a window out so we can... We need to inspect all the way around. All the way around it. And, and really, you know, it, that can't be done if you still want to sort of maintain the security or the weatherproofing of the building. Um, if you're 
know, removing like into a, a floor void. Sometimes getting into a floor void, you know, is really hard and taking up floorboards or, you know, a raised flooring, it can never go back down sometimes. And uh, they're the sort of things you need to be thinking about. That's it. The things that I've kind of learned over the years, with the best will in the world, you can look at an area, like you say, floorboards. That, that's an interesting one because you think, well, they're just bloody floorboards. So yeah. you've got to get a jemmy on one end, just raise it a little bit, then you take yeah. the nails out, or it's screwed down. I mean, the amount of times when we've tried to do that and the boards break, the nails break, the yeah. screws break, yeah. and it just ends up a complete and utter shit show. Yeah. <laughs> and basically the only way to get into that void... It's splintering the wood up. Yeah, and, you, you yeah. essentially destroy that layer of floor to get into the void to check and there's nothing that can be done because the wood's old and degraded and it's not until you start doing these kind of works that they are intrusive no, nothing is kind of it's like that saying isn't it about best laid plans and all that yeah and you can't always guarantee that okay you want to preserve that wood but sometimes it's just impossible to do so yeah definitely and even a simple thing of flooring exactly um lino yeah. floor yeah I don't know how many times you can carefully take up um, lino floor, but it kind of rips, tears. It's been glued down with like, you know, some unbelievably strong glue. And, and to inspect, to see if there's anything underneath that, sometimes you just can't do it without ruining that floor, can you? No, exactly. And, that's it. And if you're planning to have people working in that office afterwards, then, you know, that's not going to be possible potentially. No. I mean, things like that are like, the obvious ones are the kind of medical floors, things like that, and toilet floors where they actually yeah. weld, yeah. like plastic weld the, the lino in place and stuff. Obviously, yeah. when we're doing that, we can't de-weld that and remove it and then put it back down in the same way no, of and, it being put in in the first place. Yeah, and you'll probably be breaching the infection barrier as well. So exactly like, that. You know, you're opening those areas up. So yeah, there's there's lots of things that need to think about with regards to kind of carrying up those surveys safely, isn't there? Mm. And it's, yeah, like I said, it's doing them at the right time um, to make sure that you can carry on with your project. Now, that said, I mean, the other thing to think about, like we've just mentioned about repatching over and how you want it left, if you are planning on uh, a little farmer out with his gun. <laughs> Morning, farmer. Yeah. What kind of level do you need? Do you reckon he got it or not? <laughs> <laughs> He's had two goes. <laughs> yeah, kind of what level do you need the refurb or the pre-refurbishment to look like? So in a school, for instance, depending on the level of intrusiveness that we have to carry out, we could do sort of high-level inspection holes and then repatch them over just with bits of timber. It doesn't look pretty. It's not as pretty as what it looks originally, but it makes it safe for the office users, the children, whatever, to go back in there. Yeah. But if you're in an environment or you've got clients where, I don't know, you need that, like you said, the infection barrier, the infection level to be safe and secure, well, then we need to look at getting other trades involved, don't we? Yeah. And you also mentioned uh, about windows. Windows are, are a, a great one. I mean, sometimes we're the best will in the world. And even if a client says to us, look, we're not bothered about the security of the site. We're not bothered about the rain integrity of the site. Just do what you've got to do. If you've yeah. got to smash your window out, smash your window out. Yeah. Some bloody windows are just solid to get out and I don't even know how they come out. <laughs> and again, like we need to employ window fitters that can, they know about the windows. They know how they were installed so they can take them out for us. Yeah, take them out safely. I think that's the, that's the key, isn't it? It's like, it's getting into the, the actual frame and dismantling them correctly. That's the idea. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That, that's a very good point, getting, getting additional points. Because... When you've got properties like historical grade listings, and uh, there's sometimes that we need additional trades, isn't it? So yeah, sounds like somebody's doing a refurb <laughs> behind us now. So we had the farmer out, and now we've got somebody doing a refurb behind us yeah, so with their chop saw. We could enliven the field. It's, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> that's what happens. So yeah, when you've got grade listings on buildings, that, that's something really important to think about. Is trying to get into those historical interest areas so you may need you know we've done projects in the past where we've had to hire in specialist carpenters yeah not, not just not, a not chippy just, yeah not just a chippy like specialist 
you know, woodworkers. Like the old uh, Yellow Pages advert. <laughs> yeah. Hello, do you have a, a French polisher? <laughs> yeah, one of those. That kind of uh, trade. To safely take stuff off and put it back yeah. as, you know... As Oak panelling, teak panelling, things yeah, like that. In, as if in... it's never been moved. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so there's lots to think about on the refurb turbo, isn't there? Definitely. So like we say, it's not just about, right, I need a refurbishment survey first at the beginning of the project. It's how does that actually look? How and when am I getting the surveyors in? What do they actually need to access that perhaps is going to affect all of the other trades? It's not just the stuff within that room. Like we said, it's the services and things like that, where they go back to. It's it's checking those routes back to the main electrics board, back to the gas, whatever it is. Yeah, It's making sure that the asbestos surveyor has checked everything that is going to be disturbed as part of the refurbishment works. Yeah, and then planning any necessary trades to assist the survey as well. Yeah. Something we didn't mention is, you know, if you are looking to, you know, replace heating or boilers or electrical units, as part of the survey, the surveyor will need to obviously check those items. So, you know, you may need to isolate those, you may need to get them drained down, and even help inspect. So, for instance, boilers, old boilers that you've got in your boiler rooms, you know, we would hire in or ask the client to provide their, you know, um, heating engineers to to help us, in, you know, open up and inspect the boilers and any sort of plant equipment that's been affected by the refrigerant surveys. And sometimes this can only happen at the point of dismantling itself. So that's something to bear in mind of, especially with boilers, or well, kind of anything. So if you're carrying out a refurb and there's areas that you can't get the surveyor in to check and fully inspect beforehand, well, you do run the risk of delays. That's the only thing. Yeah. So sometimes you're better off having that delay at the beginning of the project to get the surveyor in before any of the other works are planned so that they can inspect areas. Because we've had it on projects where clients haven't been able to get us in beforehand and then we go and crack on with the survey and lo and behold, literally within the first half an hour of doing the survey, we find licensed asbestos products in yeah. a damaged condition and therefore it kind of it halts the job because yeah. nobody else can even go and do anything exactly. until that asbestos is dealt with. Yeah, definitely. If you have got a time-sensitive or you know a money-sensitive project where you cannot afford delays then you need to do as much as you can. Like yeah. Go as far as you can possibly before the refurbishment with regards to the asbestos survey. Because if there's ever going to be a delay, having a delay with asbestos, you know, there's always downtime. Um, especially if you're talking licensed products, you know, you've got a two-week notification. You would never get a waiver for what the HC would deem as poor planning. So, you know, that's dead time to your project. Exactly. If so. you cannot afford that, then you need to go as far as you can with the asbestos survey at the front end. And if that means getting in additional trades to make sure you can access areas, if you need to close off areas of the building to ensure that, you know, the asbestos survey can go as far as it can, then I would always recommend that. Like you, like you say, the dead time. So you've got the two-week notification period, plus however long the actual asbestos project is going to take itself. Yeah. And... We know, I mean, licensed materials, they're difficult to remove. It's never a straightforward project. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it could range from a day to months yeah. of a delay, depending yeah. on how big the project is and how big an issue the asbestos is there. So you're then into kind of that risk area. If you've got other trades on site and you've got damages in the contract and things like that, well you could be looking at a hefty bill to yeah. pay the workers for the downtime, yeah. to pay the client at the end the kind of liquidated damages for overrunning on that contract. Yeah, definitely. You know, equipment that they've hired and stuff like that, that can soon rack up the cost, can't it? It can indeed. To give you an example of that, you know, in, retail is probably the most kind of time-sensitive industry, I'd, I'd think, where if you've got a shop that trades... They certainly push us that way. Yeah, but, you know, the only way that they make money is, is being open and trading. Yeah. So, you know, any day to them closed is lost revenue. And they're always very, very time sensitive on their refurb. They always plan to, you know, the second, really. And, mm. you know, any delays on them is 
you know, can really affect their business. Yeah, I mean, I've heard figures banded about before by some of the large retailers that basically having even one square metre closed off per day cost them £10,000. Wow. And, so yeah. It's shut a whole store. Exactly. And then have, you know, two weeks plus and downtime. Look, look at Primark recently. They put the figures in the press of the coronavirus thing and shutting them. It's cost them... I can't even remember what it was. It was like 750 million, wasn't it? Yeah. Ridiculous. It was something ridiculous for, and that's what it cost them a month. Yeah. So if you break that back down to store level, again, it's that kind of thought process of how much does that area cost? How much does that store cost? Yeah. And for the sake of getting that, I don't know, paying the extra couple of hundred pounds on getting the survey done correctly full access you know if you've got to hire in additional trades to take additional access equipment to get into these areas or even maybe additional trades to make good the yeah. asbestos survey it's kind of weighing that up the benefit of that versus you know any risk of delays that's the it the upfront cost on that would be completely outweighed if asbestos is identified up front yeah. before you've got all the contractors in before you've got all the equipment on site before you've got all those liquidated damages in that contract yeah. that just outweighs it even if the, the survey ends up costing sort of three four five times what it normally would mm. who cares when you've dotted the i's crossed the t's everybody yeah. knows where they're at and it's kind of that can then like you say be incorporated into the overall project time scale yeah happy days well i hope you uh took some use from that this is our first outdoor recording. Al fresco. Al fresco. We've had guns going off. We've had chop saws going off. People we've, saying good morning. Yeah, we had some hikers <laughs> saying good morning that we gave them a little wave to. <laughs> it's quite interesting. Yeah. So, yep, yeah, hope you found that useful. Remember, asbestos first, not last.